let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, once again, we bow before you and we thank you for this opportunity to dive into your word. Lord, we are truly blessed beyond measure. You've given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. And Lord, you know that we are up against it every day. As we just sang, we're up against the foe, Satan, the adversary, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. And as we sang, he is a formidable foe. And that's why we need to fight him in your strength and with your armor. As we focus on our spiritual struggle today, Lord, I pray that you would bless our time in the word. I know that your word never returns to you void. It always accomplishes what you sent it to do. So just have your way, Lord. Speak through me. Apply this word to our hearts and help us to use it so we can be those vessels of honor fit for the master's use. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. National Geographic once ran an article about the Alaskan bull moose. The males battle for dominance during the fall breeding season, literally going head to head, crunching together as they collide. Often their antlers get broken and that ensures defeat. The toughest moose with the biggest and strongest antlers will triumph. And so the battle which is fought in the fall is really won in the summer when the moose eat continually. The one that consumes the best diet for growing antlers and gaining weight will be the heavyweight champion of the fight. Those that eat inadequately will have weaker antlers and less bulk. There's a spiritual lesson for us here. Spiritual battles await you. Satan will choose a season to attack you. Will you be victorious or are you going to fall into his trap? Much of it depends on what you do now before the struggle begins. I guess you can call it the bull moose principle. Enduring faith, strength, and wisdom for trials, tests, and temptations are best developed now before they're needed. But where does that power and authority come from? That's what I want to dive into today as we continue what we uh, started last week in Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to show you that your strength is in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So how do you fight the devil? Plain and simple. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Amen? Since this is a spiritual struggle, you need spiritual strength to fight the spiritual battle against the devil. You can't rely on your own power in this kind of fight. Remember what Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen? So you've got to put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil because Satan, he will try to seduce you with deceitful strategies and subtle tactics. He tries to make you doubt God. He tries to get you to deny, disregard, and disobey the word of God. As I told you last week, it's like when you go fishing. The adversary, he lures you with some enticing bait, but he hides the hook. He doesn't want you to see the consequences of sin, amen? He tempts you into thinking you can find fulfillment and happiness in material things like drugs and alcohol and food and power and money and sex. He causes turmoil and division in your home. Husbands not honoring their wives. Wives disrespecting their husbands, children fighting each other and disobeying their parents. Your adversary hates you. We just sang about that. Your adversary hates you and he hates God and he wants to destroy our church by bringing division to your family. 
You cannot stand against the enemy without appropriating the whole armor of God. If you believe that, say amen. amen. As we saw in the scriptures last week, it said, Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. So God gives us some insight into who we are fighting against. And he says that your struggle is not physical. Your struggle is not physical. Verses 12 and 13, look at what he says here. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This passage tells us that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. You know what that means, right? We're not fighting against humans. We're not fighting against people. This is a spiritual struggle, amen? amen. Yes, you do have an enemy, but it's not your spouse. Your enemy is not some other family member. Your enemy is not your neighbor. Your enemy is not that person in church that knows how to get your goat. The devil may use those people, but that battle originated in the spiritual realm long before it was acted out in the physical. If you believe that, say amen. So who are these rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness? The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Who are these invisible beings mentioned that you've got to fight against? Well, Satan is behind many of your temptations, and we looked at him in detail last week. He uses things in this evil world system to appeal to your sinful nature and to lure you into sin. He also attacks you directly through using his demons. And God tells us how to deal with the world and the flesh and the devil. He says, resist the devil, flee every temptation, and deny this body of flesh. And remember, you're not fighting against people. You're not fighting against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against the rulers, it says, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So what does all that mean? It means that there is order in um, the heavenlies between the devil and his demons. Just like in the military, you've got generals and colonels and lieutenants and sergeants and privates. These demonic powers seem to be ranked according to rule and power, and Satan is their commander-in-chief. So you got to take them seriously. you got to take them seriously. So how do we win the battle? Your supply is the armor of God, the whole armor of God. Verses 13 through 18. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Since you are fighting an invisible foe, you've got to be fully clothed in the whole armor of God. Amen? Amen. When you chose to follow Jesus, you entered into a spiritual struggle that's been raging for thousands of years. But you don't have to fear. Jesus is near. As a matter of fact, God never tells us to fear the devil. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10? He said, don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot destroy the soul. He said, rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. Can you say amen this morning? Fear not, stand your ground. Over and over again in that passage, we see stand, stand firm, stand strong, hold your ground. That's what God wants. 
The bull moose principle, remember, you got to be prepared with the armor of God before you're attacked because without it, you're going to be too weak to stand against the spiritual forces of wickedness. You know what's interesting about this armor of God? And I never realized this until about a year ago. To put on the armor of God is actually to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. To put on the whole armor of God is actually to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. So if you're not gratifying the flesh, you are gratifying the spirit. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Every battle-tested piece of armor points to Jesus Christ, who is our divine warrior. Can you say amen this morning? I want you to look at the similarities between the armor of God mentioned in Ephesians 6 and a couple of Old Testament passages from Isaiah. Uh, concerning the Messiah, look at what he says in Isaiah 11:5. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Now, Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And he may have been looking at a Roman soldier. He may have been chained to a Roman soldier for all we know. So he saw the armor that this soldier had. But this concept of the armor of God, it began back in the Old Testament. Let me show you another passage from Isaiah 59. Look at the similarities between this and Ephesians chapter 6. He put on, talking about Messiah, the Lord Jesus, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as with a cloak. Jesus, our divine warrior, defeated the devil, amen? And when you put on his armor, you're putting on battle-tested armor. And so God equips you with nothing less than his own armor, the same armor that Jesus wore on your behalf during his personal struggle against the mortal enemy of our souls. So according to verse 14 in Ephesians 6, you're to defend yourself and stand firm. Look at what he says. There, there it is again. Stand. Hold your ground. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The belt was critical for the ancient Roman warrior. You know, they wore robes, and so if he was going to be prepared to engage in battle, he needed to lift those robes and cinch everything in his belt so he could move effectively, keep everything in place. And the belt of truth prepares you to engage in the spiritual fight. We live in an age when people say truth is relative. Anybody ever heard that? You know, Romans chapter 1 says people know the truth, but they suppress the knowledge of the truth. Amen? You've probably heard people say, well, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. That's your truth. That ain't my truth. Or they'll say there's no such thing as absolute truth. Listen, to say that there's no such thing as absolute truth is an absolute truth in itself. So your whole argument is a contradiction. Truth is an absolute unchangeable standard. And you live by it all the time whether you realize it or not. Imagine you're, you're cruising along on I-70. And you're flying at about 90 miles an hour. Is it time to confess? You're cruising at 90 miles an hour. You get pulled over by a cop for speeding. And he says, do you realize you were going 90 miles an hour? Well, try telling the cop, that's your truth. That ain't my truth. My truth is I was going 75. Let me know how that works for you. You probably end up in jail for that kind of stupidity. Doesn't matter what you say. His radar gun is the absolute truth. Amen? So there is such a thing as absolute truth, whether you want to admit it or not. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 4.21 says, the truth is in Jesus. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. The truth is in Jesus. John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Satan is a liar. 
and he's a loser. To be honest with you, Jesus said of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is a liar. He will lie to you and he will tell you that, oh, you can get to heaven by doing good deeds. The truth is, you need to surrender your life to Jesus. That's the way you're saved. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Satan will tell you, you can't be delivered from addiction. But Jesus said in John 8, 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. The enemy will try to tell you, oh, nobody understands your grief and your pain. Nobody knows what you're going through. But Jesus knows and he understands. He was a man of sorrows. Isaiah said of him, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yes, Jesus knows what you're going through and you can cry out to him whenever you're grieving. But see, if you don't wear that belt of truth, you are going to believe every lie that the enemy throws your way, and we live in a world full of lies. There are a lot of voices out there in the world, and most of them are lying to you. The very next piece of armor mentioned is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness, that's not talking about your own righteousness, amen? Because Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags in the sight of God, amen? Amen. He's talking about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, a true believer, his sinless life is credited to your account, and his sin-bearing death makes you stand righteous in the sight of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was tempted like we are. Hebrews says he was tempted in every point as we are, yet without sin. God put all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, on him on the cross. He took the full force of the wrath of God on that cross. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so you wear that breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart against the attacks of the devil because he wants to replace your righteous living with immorality and impurity and greed and gossip and envy and jealousy and disobedience. And the followers of Jesus, Scripture says, we are to pursue and practice righteousness. Amen? 1 John 2.29 says, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Everyone who practices righteousness has been born of God, but the devil wants you to rationalize your sin rather than confront it and confess it and deal with it. He wants you to revel in the pleasures of sin because even scripture says sin is pleasurable for a season, but then you got to deal with the consequences. Amen? He wants you to revel in the pleasures of sin so that your conscience becomes calloused rather than fighting for righteousness. 1 John 3.10 tells us, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so through the power of the Holy Spirit, God has given every true believer the breastplate of righteousness to guard your heart so that you can live a holy life and so that you can pursue and practice righteousness. The next piece of armor is the gospel shoes we pick up at verses 14 and 15. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We all have different kinds of shoes. Some of us have too many shoes. But that's another sermon altogether. You got work shoes, you got dress shoes, you got exercise shoes, you got church shoes. I don't know what kind of shoes you're wearing today, but you're not going to be ready to stand against the enemy unless you prepare your feet. That's what the Word of God says. You've got to put on the gospel shoes, amen? 
Shoes were essential to the success of the ancient soldier in battle because if he lost his footing, the enemy could push him back, knock him down, and kill him. Roman soldiers typically wore thick leather sandals that were studded with cleats on the bottom so they could stand firm, so they could hold their ground. So the shoes you wear are important because the enemy, he wants to push you back. He wants to knock you down and he wants to defeat you. That's his job description, right? Steal, kill, and destroy, and he's good at it. If you want to stand firm against the cosmic powers of darkness and not lose your ground, you need the shoes of the gospel of peace. So how does the gospel of peace function as part of the armor for battle against the spiritual forces of wickedness? Well, knowing exactly what God has done for you through Jesus Christ is going to enable you to stand firm, amen? And the gospel of peace makes you ready to stand because it demands continued proclamation. You see, the gospel's too great a message to keep to yourself. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Listen to what Isaiah has to say about those who share the good news. He says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So how are your feet looking today? Do you talk to people about Jesus? Do you have beautiful feet? In the physical realm, your feet may be ugly. They may be crusty. They may be stinky. They may be dirty. They may be full of toe jam. But God says when you talk about Jesus, when you share the good news about Jesus, you got beautiful feet. Amen? Amen. Whenever you share the good news about Jesus, you are standing firm and you are fighting against the spiritual forces of wickedness. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Next, he talks about the shield of faith. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, a lot of times when we think about the ancient soldiers, we think about those small shields that they would use in hand-to-hand combat. But one of the shields that the Roman soldiers would use was about the size of a door. And they would stand next to each other, crouch down behind those shields, and that way they could be completely protected from the enemy. And then they would cover those wooden shields with leather that had been soaked in water. So when the enemy shot a flaming arrow their way, that wet leather would extinguish the flaming arrows. And in the same way, Satan is flinging all those fiery darts and flaming arrows at you, but you can extinguish every one of them with the shield of faith. Faith is how you cling to God during those times of testing and trials and temptation. Amen? Amen. Satan will tell you, God doesn't love you, but by faith, you know that God loves you with an everlasting love. Amen? Amen? Satan will try to make you think that God doesn't care about you, but by faith, you know that God loves you with a compassionate, everlasting love, those who fear him. Satan will tell you, oh, God's not going to provide for you, but by faith you know that God said he's going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Satan will tell you, oh, God, no, hear your prayers, but by faith you know that Jesus said whatever you ask in his name, he would do it. Satan will tell you, oh, your sins are so horrible, God could never forgive you, but you know by faith, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The shield of faith extinguishes every fiery dart of doubt and every flaming arrow of falsehood that the enemy flings your way. If you believe that, say amen this morning. And then verse 17 talks about the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects your head and your brain. The helmet of salvation is important because the spiritual struggle begins in the mind. That's where it begins. And when the enemy brings ungodly thoughts into your mind, you got to take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen? Amen. Philippians 4, 8, God wants you to think about the good stuff. That's what he says. Think about what is good and what is honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and things that are excellent and worthy of praise. He said, think on these things. 
Now, every piece of the armor that I have described so far is defensive. I don't know if you thought about that. But you also need to utilize your offensive weapons. We have a couple of offensive weapons mentioned. And in verse 17, he says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. (laughs) You know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And like with the word love, they've got like five different Greek words for love. And we've got one word. Well, here where it says the word of God, there's several different Greek words for the word word. Does that make sense? Graphe is the written word. Okay. There's logos, which is the message of the written word. And then there is rhema, that's the spoken word, and that's what is used here in this verse. The spoken word is like a divine dagger that plunges into the heart of the enemy. And when the devil's all up in your face, that's when you need the rhema of God. You got to speak truth to him, amen? When you speak the word of God, Satan can't handle it. It's like in that movie, A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth. Satan can't handle the truth. Remember when when Jesus was tempted? Three times Satan came to him and tempted him, and every time Jesus responded with the spoken word of God, it is written, it is written, it is written, and what happened? The devil left him. But the next verse says he would come back at a more opportune time. The sword of the Spirit, the spoken word of God, will chase the enemy away for a while, but he'll be back. Think about this. If Jesus, the living word, needed the spoken word to deal with the enemy of the word, how much more do you and I need to know it and use it when we're tempted? Come on. That's why you need to know it, amen? Memorize it so that you've got it when you need it. And then the last offensive weapon in your arsenal is prayer. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication so that you can remain in constant contact with our commander in chief. Can you say amen? Because he's got the best vantage point of your situation and he's the only one who is sovereign. That means the enemy can't do anything without his permission. So remember, prayer is a valuable offensive weapon in keeping the enemy at bay. How are you doing so far? Listen, when you're tempted, pray. Amen? Amen? When the enemy oppresses you, pray. Jesus told us to pray, deliver us from evil. And in some versions, it says deliver us from the evil one. Prayer is an offensive weapon against the enemy. When you're praying in the spirit, it reminds you that you're never walking alone. Because God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God was with Paul when he wrote this letter in prison. And he is going to be with you in the midst of your struggles. And listen, don't just relegate prayer to when you're in trouble. Don't just relegate prayer to when times get hard. The Bible encourages us to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Romans 12, 12 says, be constant in prayer. And Colossians 4, 2 says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Listen, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't know how to pray. If you don't know how to pray, pray the word of God. Pray the word of God, amen? Amen. There is nothing better that you can pray than pray the word of God back to God in prayer. There are many prayers in the Bible that you can use for your own purposes in prayer. And most of the Psalms you can turn into prayers back to God. Remember, this is a spiritual struggle. Amen? Your adversary, the devil, Peter says he's he's prowling about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And if you're not careful, he will eat you up. He wants to overpower you. He wants to take you down. He wants to control you with drugs and alcohol and bad relationships and immorality and impurity and discouragement and unforgiveness and low self-esteem and mental instabilities. But Jesus said he's a liar. And I say he's a loser. Amen? Because we know where he's going and we know where we're going. Amen? Amen? And one more thing, Satan doesn't have any authority over you. The only way he can have power over you is if you give it to him. You can stand firm 
against him in the strength that comes from the victory that Jesus has already won. Amen? Jesus won the victory. He came to destroy the works of the devil. So that means you're not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. And that changes everything. When you know you're fighting from victory, your whole perspective changes. Think about this for a second. Sometimes I, I like to watch the highlight videos of certain football games because it's easy to sit down and watch a video for 15, 20 minutes instead of wasting three hours on a game. And that way I can catch up on all of them. <laughs> but since the game has already been played, I already know the outcome. And I know whether or not my team has already won. So if my team has already won, I don't have to worry about it. Are you tracking with me? I don't have to get all stressed out when the other team scores a touchdown. I don't have to worry if my quarterback throws an interception or if our running back fumbles the ball because I already know what the outcome is. Amen? When I know that my team has already won the game, it changes my whole perspective. So you don't have to get all stressed out. You don't have to worry because we know the outcome, amen? Jesus already won the war. And we are left here to fight the battle every day. Remember, you are not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. And Jesus will give you victory every time if you just trust him and obey him and be completely yielded to him and dependent upon him, fully clothed in his armor. If you believe that, say amen this morning. Let me wrap this up. We got to learn to resist the devil. God says if you resist him, he'll flee from you. Amen? Amen? But he'll be back at a more opportune time. Whenever you yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and you're under his control, you are fully clothed in the armor of God. You're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give you one last scripture reference to encourage your heart today. 1 John 4, 4. It says, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Are you saved today? Are you born again? Are you? Have you been regenerated? You have new life in Jesus Christ? Anybody? A couple of you. If you do, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit, amen? You have the Holy Spirit living within you, and according to this verse, he is much greater than the spirit that's in the world. That means the Holy Spirit is greater than the devil and all his demons combined. The Holy Spirit is greater than all the rulers and authorities and the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And God says, you're a conqueror. No, that's not what he says. He says, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? Greater is he who's within you than he that is within the world. Think about that. You are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves you. And he's already won the victory. Praise God. Hallelujah. Trust him. Obey him. Be fully clothed in the whole armor of God, and you will be able to stand firm against every fiery dart and every flaming arrow and every subtle scheme that the devil throws your way. You can do it. Let the church say amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father. Yes, we are up against a formidable foe. And as we sang, he, he's out to give us woe. <laughs> the body he may kill, but your truth abideth still. And we will win the battle. The battle's already been won. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. But we have to fight that battle every day. It's a spiritual struggle. So Lord, if we trust you and we obey you and we surrender to you and we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and we yield to his control, we can win every battle. Satan's a defeated foe. 
Jesus has won the victory, and we are fighting from victory. And help us to remember that. (laughs) Greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us. Father, I just pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us. (laughs) Help us to remember that we have the armor of God. (laughs) We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and be fully clothed with that shield of faith and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation. All of these things, Lord, you have provided for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Every piece of armor that we have has been battle-tested by you, Jesus, and we thank you for giving us the provision. You are indeed Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides all that we need. Father, help us. Help us to stand strong against the enemy so we can be those vessels of honor fit for the master's use. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake today. Amen and amen.